place then. Were you, did you have lots of lessons as you were growing up? Uh, I was and... yeah, classically trained on the piano um, and got a scholarship to good school yeah. and um, carried that on for a bit and then got much more interested in other things, mm. um, including um, electronics. So I started at school, I started making amps, guitar amps, oh, right. wow. and they had a, a kind of basic recording area mm. and had a four track um, tape machine, Tascam. Right. So, sort of 14 or 15, I started recording mm. my own tunes. I see. And, you know, experimenting with overdubbing and right. layering. And so, even before becoming a professional musician, you were already I was in the fiddling. studio tech. And I'd already got into kind of the nerdy side yeah. of music. Um, and um, I should dig those old recordings out, actually. Mm. They're quite interesting to hear. <laughs> Really self indulgent, so you meaningful, in passionate stuff. Yeah, probably, yeah. Utter crap. <laughs> I, got, um, I got plenty of those myself, yeah. And then about 17, um, I went, I started clubbing with my sister, and uh, she kind of introduced me to the London club scene, right. late 80s uh -huh. kind of house scene. Yeah. I thought, oh, I can do this. This is yeah. not too, right. too hard. You yeah. know, I can tackle this. So I left school and um, went up to town and and started kind of making dance records. Right, right. Um, and had a release on London Records, under the, the uh, uh, Kleptomaniacs, we were called, and kind of stonking, hardcore house it was. And this was all done in your bedroom or something? That was all done in, in bedrooms, right. or right. actually there was a, this, uh, the label that I released on was a kind of, you know, he was the archetypal, you're going to get ripped off the first time mm. you're in the music industry type pod, yeah. which I did. Yeah. And you know we sold a few. We sold about twelve thousand. Wow. Uh, copies actually, and I saw nothing. Yeah. So, so I got burnt. That's fine. Uh, I don't begrudge him. And then um, I kind of carried on making dance records. And this was all copies. on Akai samplers and Ataris and Akai samplers, Creator, um, and had a Mackie desk. Right. And that was kind of Studio One, mm. and it worked quite well actually. Mm. Mackies, you know, great. They sound fine. Good yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. And then I met Jay, Jamari Kwai, mm. frontman. And I was around a, a mutual mate's house, and Jay played um, a demo, sort of then and there, put on a tape of, of what was When You're Gonna Learn, which he'd been working on, which was his first single. Yeah. And, um, and he was kind of going in the direction, his direction was where I'd naturally been kind of mm. going myself, yeah. which is lots of minor nine chords yeah. <laughs> and uh, kind of more funky yeah. kind of melody, melodic based mm. thing and I'd, I'd been kind of gagging to work with a singer and so uh, but at that, at that meeting we just didn't we just kind of said hello and yeah. nothing yeah. came of it and then right. about a month later his manager at the time a guy called Tenji um, phoned up and my our mutual mate had told him that I was a keyboard player yeah and Jay wanted to work with mm. a keyboard player so I went around and met Jay uh, his mum's house in Ealing Common, and um, we sat down and kind of chatted and wrote T on tonight in uh, five minutes, mm -hmm. and then that was yeah, that was it. To yeah. Start. yeah. So that that kind of path. Yeah. So so during me. your long tenure with Jim Rockwell, were you still pressing buttons on mixing discs at all? Or? Yeah, always. Right. Mm. In what capacity was that sort of? Projects in between Jamaica albums, or in between, yeah. I was doing, still doing my own stuff. I got really into trance music right. um, and that trance scene, so I was doing trance records um, in between and always writing. It was yeah. mostly writing hmm. for Jamaica, so I'd be oh, writing right. yeah. stuff at home. I didn't do third party stuff except for the odd trance record. Hmm. And um, and then when we were in the studio, I mean, you know, Al Stone hmm. produced uh, two, three, and four. Do you do four? Two. Yeah, I think you do. Or do you do three? I can't remember. Um, and uh, the first album was engineered by a guy called Mike Nilsson. Right. Um, a New Zealand guy from New Zealand. Mm. Really oversized forearms. <laughs> he used to go on about. Yeah, he used to go on about enzymes eating the desk or something, and things weren't quite going right. But he's pretty good actually. Good mm. feel. Mm. Um, well, it sounds alright. Yeah, so so I was doing stuff in between, but it was yeah. mostly 
you know, it was all geared around writing tracks and for Jamiroquai. Were... It was all encompassing, kind of. So presumably, you'd say Al Stone is the person you learnt the most about engineering and producing records. Would no, you? no, I wouldn't actually, because I wasn't really concentrating. You weren't paying the blindest bit of notice. Not, yeah, <laughs> no, you know, it was, so it was annoying actually. <laughs> and then when I left and I wanted to do it, there was I was like, fuck, what mics was he using and what was he? How, how did he do it? You know, and what was what was happening? Um, and I did phone him up. I can remember when I left the band. I was like, "Al, look, I'm going to record some drums. What what mic should I use?" You know, and he's like, "Get some 41s, you know, maybe a couple of four and fours." So you know, he right. he helped, but I didn't concentrate at all. But this year, I was mostly, you know, it, it, I mean, we we self-produced really. Yes. Yes. Um, and the whole kind of you know the what production is is it's quite a tricky one, isn't it? Because mm. you can, it's it's so many different things. And I remember when Jay and I first started working and Muff Winwood, who was our boss at Sony, had organised some meetings with some producers and I can't remember his name now. The guy, Pete, somebody. Not Waterman, Pete. Oh, I can't. He brought this guy around the guy, and, the, and we sort of were sitting and we were all full of ourselves and really thought we knew what <laughs> we were doing and he's like, look, a good producer does nothing. And we're like, really? You're going to get paid for doing nothing you know, it, did, it was really <laughs> odd to us that it, yeah. but I understand much better now what yeah. he was talking about about standing off and what a producer's role is in terms of just letting um, bands get on with it yeah uh, but yeah. and being a presence to kind of steer them and you know that that catalyst for it happening mm. you know because I, 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 I've, I've definitely experienced that you know when I've been yeah. producing that you know bands do will get on with it but mm. you just you know you, you need to input when you need to input right so it's important to not say things sometimes. Yeah, but I die in all the time. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> annoying and tell them what to do all the time. Yeah. Um, so, so why, excuse my ignorance, why did you stop playing with Jamiroquai? What happened there? I, I just had enough, right. really. It had been ten years. Mm. And and did you have something to go family. to? Was there, a, was there a sort of, oh, you got the family? No, I had to, yeah, family what? really was a, was a, a kind of right. main factor in it. Yeah. And... Um, we were touring, touring was getting quite hard because mm. I couldn't, you know, family wasn't really included in that, yeah. and that yeah. part of it. And, um, and presumably you earned a fair bit of money by this stage from some of the rights. Yeah, I mean, it did, it, I wanted to, I just needed like to change. Need to be out to yeah, I, it was just, it was quite, it was just getting yeah. you know, tricky yeah. to be away from home, mm. and it was difficult to fight for it because, um, you know, it was, I had a young daughter and, mm. So it was time to kind of change and, and um, try something different. Do you do much hands-on Pro Tools stuff? Or no, I don't you actually now. Do I, I, yeah, this is usually, I'm do very, I'm only Sam, as good as yeah. my engineer. <laughs> it was mostly Sam Miller and then um, now using sort of different people. Mm. So you were sort of talking earlier about the chap you used for the, the Hoosiers album. Max. Max. Because he's done a few good records, isn't he? He's done yeah. he did editors and did the editors. Yeah, and didn't he do? He's the, in the second editors, I think. Right. Didn't he do Glass Vegas? As Glass well? Vegas. Yeah. So he's doing the second Glass Vegas. Mm. Yeah, Max is very good. He's he's uh, very German. I mean, he's not very German. He's very <laughs> English German. He's a German man. He's become very English. Yeah. But you that makes him sound like he's trying to be English, which is not. <laughs> he's just seems but to have <laughs> absorbed. He might have been really funny before, but he's a funny guy, mm. and in an English funny way. Yeah. And uh, he's great, actually. Love Max. And he's somebody you can trust to just sort of get on with. Yeah, and he's he's like. he's my kind of, you know, he really is fastidious and mm. takes his time and is very experimental. And, you know, that's how I like, I, I was very spoiled, you know, with the mm. five um, albums that I did with Jamiroquai. We mm. just took the time that we wanted to take. Yeah. So, you know, it was kind of a minimum of six months, which is hugely indulgent and you could never do now. But it meant that um, we could waste loads of time um, experimenting and, and having fun, mm. which I like to do. And so, um, and Max will take his time and will experiment and won't just go to default right. setting with amps and mm. mics and, and you know, and I really like to try different mics out too. So we mm. had fun kind of using, just going through the mic collection and trying different things yeah. um, to amp up, he's obviously mic up, um, guitar amps and stuff. Yeah, but he's obviously got a good, good sort of perception of how much time he should spend because you sort of you, you get so used to having deadlines and yeah, you know. Well, but with the Hoosiers, it was a bit. We, we had a little bit more time because yeah. 
was the Hoosiers assigned to my and my partner's company right. as a, on a production deal. Mm. So we uh, we didn't have this quite the same deadline, mm. and you know even though the label was kind of frantic, in fact it you know it worked out that that because we had more time, we were writing all the time. You know th there was writing happening, yeah. and you know every kind of couple of months something new would happen, and 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 you know oust previous m main tracks. Mm. So up until last week when they did another track. Uh, which is now going to make the you know it's now yeah. going to be one of the key singles. Right. So it's kind of and yeah. now finally we're stopping. Right. <laughs> right. And are you co have you months. been co-writing with the band then? Actually, did on the last one. Yeah. The first single, uh, which is called Choices, I I wrote with Owen, mostly. Um, so what was your input to that? Was it sort of core structures and? Well, things at the beginning of the records, uh, the Jupiter was set up over there, and I was kind of faffing mm. like you do. Came up with a riff, and Owen came over my shoulder. And sung a melody and kind of, um, been, um, what's it called? It just kind of, uh, what's it called? You kind of stream of consciousness. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. You know, those kind of gibberish. Yeah. And uh, uh, gibberish lyrics and stuff. And the whole thing was about 30 seconds, which he did record on his. I was lucky. <laughs> on his uh, dictaphone, on, the, yeah. on his iPhone. And then we'd forgotten about it. And right. then about two weeks before we'd finished the record, Owen came up to me and said, do you remember this? And I was like, shit, that's really good. It's really good. And we sat next door and, you know, five minutes later, pretty much the whole thing was done. Yeah. And then uh, we recorded it and it's the uh, first single. So that was kind of exciting. Yeah. And, and from my point of view. So what was the process of that? So once you'd, you sat down for five minutes, worked out the song structure. So we sat down at the piano, I did the riff, right? We, 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 it was all there. You know, mm. the, in the 30 seconds, it had a verse and it had a chorus and, you and the, the lyrics. That you'd come up with the, this stream of consciousness gibberish lyrics yeah. that you've done actually became the lyrics. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the Hoosiers do is they're very. Um, choosy about their lyrics. They then spent sort of days trying to write, you know, reinvent <laughs> amazing lyrics, meaningful lyrics, and then we had a big battle about no, it doesn't need to mean anything. It needs, you know, how they sound and how they feel is yeah. just as important as the meaning. And then we kind of compromise, and there's meaning and the gibberish, which is actually not gibberish. It's really yeah. good, yeah. you know. So it's, it's, yeah, and then and then yeah, it just happened. So after you, you spent there on the piano, there, you and then came, we came, came in. in here and we came in and just thought about the beat, and it was all quite simple, four to the floor stuff, and, right. and we just built it up. You know that I mean, it was done in a day, pretty much. So the did whole you track. dial up drums in the computer for that? Then? Yeah, Max got samples from tracks that we'd already recorded, oh, right. and he'd made up a Drummagog um, file oh, right. of of uh, no, it wasn't Drummagog actually. Sorry, it was a uh, battery of, mm -hmm. of of drum sounds mm. from one of the other tracks. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, in c pretty comprehensive. Yeah. Um, so it was something going on in Logic, was it? No, that was in, that was that was Pro right. Tools, yeah. Battery and Pro Tools, and he had you know all the the mic samples yeah. for each sound right. there on on. So it sounded you know yeah. really beefy and sounded Excellent. like it was a mic yeah. kit. I see. Um, and then just built up. A, and that's what's on the record. The that's the on the record, and then uh, yeah, that's it's been tweaked obviously yeah. since since then. You know, it goes through the process and yeah, yeah. Interesting, and then you overdubbed each bit. And then, uh, yeah, so I just—it was—it's all synth-driven that that track. Right, it's right. one. It's the main sort of synth riff, mm. and the vocal, and then the rest of it was just all. So did you play the synth in. riff that ended up on it, or did yes, the guy yeah. in the band replay? No, no, it no I, I, I played it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I played. It. I, I played uh, a lot of the keyboards on the. F well, actually, I played all the keyboards on the first mm. Who's Who's record. And then Sam Swallow, who's uh, become their keyboard player, has now started to play a bit more. Right. I'm quite difficult, probably, as a you know, in that respect, because I just want to do it. Yeah. yeah but actually, yeah. Sam is much better than me, so <laughs> I just have to step back and. It's like, oh, God damn it! <laughs> but he's very, he's very good. He's a fantastic musician, so he's now taken on that role. And I yeah. did the odd. I'm mean, on that track. I, I kind of nuzzled him, you know, mm. muscled in and elbowed him out of the way. Yeah. And do you find yourself doing the same thing with? With your engineer reaching no, over and no, because I mean I, I you know I, it's uh, it's it's one of those if, if people come in and they if I had a quid for every time someone said you know punter said um, do you know what all these knobs do then God, yeah. how do you, I would be you know I would have retired yeah. and I actually don't so that's fine <laughs> I can say no I really don't I think it'll be modest I know, that one you must know one, you must know what they'll do these ones that's a volume <laughs> that one's a volume. <laughs> So who who? That's treble. We obviously have some Base. knowledge to, to be able to choose all this wonderful equipment. I mean, who advises you on your? No, no, I've, I've, I've uh, 
yeah, uh, well, just kind of, you know, having gains, knowledge of being in studios, mm. seeing nice bits of gear. Yeah. Um, you know, the pull tech was kind of, that was one of the first of mm. the proper bits of gear. I'm an eBay, I've just an eBay <laughs> whore. Yeah. Uh, and, and most, you know, most things are bought on eBay, mm. actually. And then you just do research and you ask people and, yes, yeah. you know, it, it's... But mostly being in studios, I guess, and, and using bits of gear. Yeah, yeah. And then being advised and trying stuff out. And most things I've bought, I have, you know, I have delivered. Mm. So, so the distresses have been amazing. You know, I just, I think the pull tech and distresser was one of the first bits of kit. I mean, right, I, I right. after leaving Jamiroquai, I wrote for about four years. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of, it was quite soul destroying in a way. I just, I mean, I was doing a lot of pop stuff and it was, you're kind of at the bottom of the ladder mm. in terms of a writer. You'll do something and then you're waiting for months to see if they're going to get that cut on the record. And then, you know, they, they'll produce it and fuck it up, which happened. And so then, who were you writing for at this point? Is this uh, I did a lot of stuff for 19, actually. Right, I see. Uh, well, that first, well, the second Will Young record yeah. I did a track on. And um, so were you some other pop idol stuff. Did you have uh, still published by EMI. Yeah. Um, and were they, I didn't were, they, were they doing anything on your behalf at this point? Uh, not much. No. <laughs> That's what Amazon publishes, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I was getting ready to, to try something different. Mm. And then um, a Neve 8068 popped up on eBay. <laughs> like they do. Like they do, in Nigeria. <laughs> so all the eBay rules. <laughs> Can't contact anyone. It's in Nigeria. Um, and I went for it anyway. And it was seven grand. Wow. Without this my camps. Right. Um, and and then it four months later it arrived. You know, I got wow. it in a in a crate, a very budgetly put together balsa wood From and string crate. <laughs> <laughs> and it did arrive, and it was Slashing. absolutely filthy. Did you uh, play with and had it some very? I did not. Uh, <laughs> no, it was tran bank transfer. And then <laughs> yeah, so it, it arrived and, and with some pretty weird. Um, Spiders crawling out of it were definitely not <laughs> indigenous. You know the really thin ones. The kind of they're yeah. the one I was like, I don't know what that is, but you're not staying. <laughs> and then Blake Devitt, the great mighty Blake, um, took all the modules away mm -hmm. and worked on them. And then I worked on the desk itself, the frame, yeah. and the wiring, and the you know what was left, yeah. cleaning it up. Starting with a toothbrush yeah. and avoid a little, you know, <laughs> tub of, of uh, warm water to yeah. cleaning wow. like that, and, and that lasted for about a day. Yeah. And then I, it occurred to me that it was made of aluminium and plastic <laughs> and copper, so it wasn't going to rust. No. So I kept, got a big brush and a big <laughs> bucket, and I jet washed it, <laughs> and and that did work actually. Yeah, yeah that worked well. Fantastic. And and it came up nice and shiny. Yeah. And I mean, then I pimped it a bit and got I got um, polishing cloths and polished you know the kind of on a drill and polished all the aluminium mm. bits, pimped my Neve. Fantastic. So they came up all shiny yeah. and polished rather than the nice matte aluminium that they should have been. <laughs> uh, and that kind of yeah changed everything because mm. now I had a d proper desk yeah. and I started buying modules, my camps, mm -hmm. and um, and it just sounded amazing. You mm. didn't need to put any EQ on, and if you had half decent mics, you could just anyone would stick something up and, and me not really knowing what I could do, you know, what to do mm. in terms of mic positions, mm. it just sounded great. And where were you this? This? this was studio number two, right. which, I, which I'd moved from my, well actually I have four studios, so the one in London was the Mackey, the, then I moved to the country and set up, uh, still the Mackey, set up, um, no then I got Yamaha, which one? O2R? O2, yeah, O2R. And I got another O2R, so you got two of them, um, and set up in, in uh, the old outhouse with the old stone brick, no sound treatment at all, right. and started recording drums. Um, and um, and then Studio 3 was just again with the I2Rs, and then I, I'd got someone involved at that point to build something. Yeah. So that was Chris Clifford, who built this one, mm. who'd, who'd worked with ADG, John Flynn and Toroshima for years. Mm. And um, someone, he actually he'd done something for me in London, someone had advised, you know, had recommended him. Hmm. And um, and then he did a design based on you know, lots of studios that he built, which is and it worked well. It's yeah. much smaller than this one, right? right. And which Mike, you'd been there, hadn't yeah. you? Yeah. Nice. And it worked. It worked nicely. It was good. Yeah. But there was, you know, I learned a few things about that one to mm -hmm. get right. And then the Neve turned up, and so yeah. I had to do. Well, you know, I should start. 
producing bands properly. Right. So I sort of started that that process mm. and started with a band called Grace. I did some demos for them, and he was a, a, a chap that I knew, a friend of mine, in London, and that kind of cut, cut my teeth mm. with recording bands. And then um, I went to see them at a gig, and the Hoosiers were playing as a support act. Right. And, and I thought, oh, they're good. Mm. I mean, they were rubbish, but I thought potential they could be brilliant because yeah. Owen's just got an outstanding mm. voice he has got mm. and breathtakingly good special voice yeah and um, I could see that a mile off so then they uh, so I talked to them afterwards and persuaded them to come up and over a month and about five days recorded four demos and right so you're just doing this sort of on spec for and the demos months. ended up being the, so the recordings actually. And they, they slept in your house and uh, yeah they st they stayed they stayed overnight yeah, I think it was about they came over a couple of weekends I think they did stay yeah um, a couple of nights and um, and I recorded those and then I met uh, the guy I work with who does the sort of management side of our business a guy called Steve Morton and he came over um, with his wife, that's who's Joe Wiley, and I'd met Joe on a train. It was one of those kind of auspicious, yeah. weird meetings. Yeah. I met Joe on the train. I'd done stuff with her right. in the old days yeah. with Live Lounge and stuff, yeah. and, and then we lived close. So he came round and I showed him the studio and played him the Hoosiers demos. And he's like, these are brilliant. He was working at Virgin at the time. Mm. He was uh, director of media at Virgin, and he was about to leave. And then we decided to kind of, you know, get involved. And the Hoosiers was the first. Thing they that we hadn't got a manager, presumably, at this point. They didn't have a manager, right. and and um, and I'd already sort of got a production deal with them going, yeah. which then Steve and I joined forces and we kind of tweaked it and did a new kind of deal with them to develop them, mm. which is um, important. But I just think that the, with with the labels don't have time, they don't have inc the inclination, they don't have the money to spend, mm. you know, that important, you know, development yeah. period. You know, it's just sort of, you know, it's just they want to hear re finished recordings. Yeah. Like, which which happens, uh, you know, because especially with the way Radio One is at the moment, mm. it's all saturated with with bedroom, you know, dance, mm. which is good and it works. Um, but but you know, with a band, you need proper studios. I think yeah. you need, if you want at least to do the drums, mm. you know, properly. Yeah. I mean, although you can get away with murder with samples and drumagog and you know, like, who knows? I I don't really. It doesn't really bother me you know if it sounds okay at the end it doesn't really matter how it, it gets mm. there but personally I like proper mixing desks proper need gear and proper mics you know yeah I think you can hear it can't you, you can. I, well, of course you can <laughs> I, you can I can <laughs> yeah. but does, does, okay, well. does, does uh, you know the guy listens to it yeah, on, his, on his phone and listens to an mp3 and you know it, I think it, it does sound different even you know you know, I think music. Look, people who really love music know know the difference. I think, mm. and and that, that, that includes. Well, does it though? You know, does it but include teenagers now? I mean, it's you know, it's all streamed off yeah. of Spotify or or we or whatever. Also, you know. if you're in somewhere like this, there's, there's magic that happens that wouldn't happen if you're in your bedroom. Whether or yeah. not the sound quality is any better, it's something about being in a studio and making a bit of an event of it, isn't it? It, totally, and I think that that's especially with with a residential. Now, I, I you know I can only speak from experience because I all the records that I did, um, including the biggest our biggest one, which was in Linford, was at residentials, and 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 actually pretty much all the the biggest records of the last twenty years, thirty years, probably you know I mean you know Radiohead, Coldplay, they're all done in residentials. Like Rhapsody? Queen, Pink Floyd, you know. Uh, they were all done in residentials. There's something about being squirrelled away in an environment with no distractions and um, you know that intensity and that that it, it works. It mm. definitely works. And something about it being an event, going to somewhere, uh, it being exciting and not mm. you know a bedroom is a bedroom and it's it's just always going to be a bedroom. Whosoever mm. bedroom it is, but if you go somewhere special, and, and also the other thing about studios, and I think that certain studios have that. Um, that something undefinable, that kind of inspirational thing mm. that that makes you come up with the goods, you know, which makes you get, it, it inspires you, mm. you know. And Great Linford had that, mm. um, and other studios I have have had that, and some other studios definitely don't have that. Some of the major studios don't have that, 
uh, which I'm not going to say, but you know, one of the biggest ones that's still alive. I, I've been there twice, and I thought this is just not working. It doesn't give you that um, excitement, that or it doesn't. You don't sit down at an instrument and start coming up with with good mm. stuff, you know, mm. with ideas. I don't know what it is. Ley lines. 